welcome everyone to week three. Uh, we're making pretty good progress. Tonight we'll, we'll, be, we'll be covering chapter three, which is on transferring hazard risk uh, through, uh, in, through insurance. And so just like last week's class were um, kind of the fundamental examples of how to you know, determine what's the appropriate amount um, and kind of what the actuaries do, this is really the, you know, the, the chapter on the, the, it's the basis of how you either self-insure, you're going to pull, you're going to transfer, you're going to form a captive, because it's pretty much the same idea as far as how you're going to layer. Um, to kind of keep things in perspective also from um, yeah, example-wise, there's a couple ways we can do this uh, to try to bring it to life a little bit. Um, um, and part of that, we'll probably use some of the examples possibly from the Philippines, because that's really where the excess and the reinsurance market comes into play. Uh, and how that would basically work in these types of situations. <coughs> so, um, and, and then there might be some other examples, and, and uh, since I do have a, a gentleman that's also, we have about three people in person <coughs> attending the class, and one is, does insurance as well, I'll probably lean on him a little bit to, to help out the, on some of these explanations as well. So, um, <coughs> so there's actually quite a few objectives with this. So last time we only had four objectives, um, and about the same amount of pages, and this time we have quite a few more. So part of what we're going to be looking at tonight is describing the purpose and operation of insurance, uh, which would include uh, including risk reduction through pooling and services provided by insure, insurers. And as we get into pooling, uh, a pool, for all, you know, is basically it's a co-op. It's the same thing as insurance, but you just decide to do it on your own, but the same mechanism basically. I want to explain how insurance benefits individuals, organizations, and society. Um, and, you know, again, why would we want to even have insurance? Why was it created in the first place? Uh, this is probably one of the key ones you're going to want to make sure you know, uh, because this will be a question. Describe the characteristics of an ideally insurable loss exposure, uh, because that's really uh, a fundamental part of, you know, what kind of insurance, you know, what do insurance companies like to insure? And so there's certain things that are what they call ideally insurable. Um, Describe the types of property and liability deductibles, what those might look like. Uh, describe purpose, operation, advantages, and disadvantages of large deductible plans. Um, and also explain why organizations need excess and or umbrella liability insurance will be another part. Describe the basic difference between excess liability insurance and umbrella liability insurance. And I think that's most likely you'll see a question dealing with that. The one is that why the first part is explain why organizations would need one or the other, and the other part is to explain the difference between the two, um, and also be able to describe uh, the different types of excess liability insurance on each operates. Um, you know, as we go in there, those little nuances there, but it's important to know those, and explain how excess umbrella liability insurance can be used in a layered liability insurance program, uh, and describe the problems that may occur with that, and uh, the, basically the problem. Uh, uh, what they call donut holes is kind of the thing that we'll talk a little bit about when you look at layers when you have insurance coverages. Uh, and also be able to describe the options for structuring the international insurance program. And again, kind of goes to the donut holes of what's covered and what's not covered. Um, as I mentioned in the email earlier for the class, that really the, there's a lot of charts and graphs. Um, and as uh, you know, another person in our office called the quilt, if you can explain the quilt, uh, the patchwork of what it looks like, uh, of what all that means. I think that'll be, you know, be able to draw the picture and explain it. Uh, then you, then you pretty much say you know the material because uh, understanding where the deductibles, what the attachment points are, where does the excess kick in, when does the umbrella, when does all these things, and you'll be able to see that. And near the end of the chapters, we kind of slowly progress. Well, the charts will be fairly simple, and by the time we go to the very end, at this heart, you know, basically pretty big, you know, patchwork of different policies of how these basically interact. So when we talk about the purpose and operation of insurance, you know, the, the idea of insurance is it helps facilitate the spread of hazard risk among those with similar loss exposures. And actually, we can probably use the Affordable Care Act as another good example of the operation of insurance. In the grand sch scheme of things, what we're trying to do is spread, you know, the risk, and you know, if we talk about health care, uh, among those with similar loss exposures, that everyone's going to have the same type. If you're looking for um, you know, for homeowners insurance, you know, or, you know, so that's what they call lines of coverage. So when we talk about insurance, insurance lines of coverage, they're very specific because they're so much, they're homogeneous, the loss exposures will be similar, and so they have a pretty good idea of how to be able to predict those. 
Um, but you know, if you said I'm just going to cover everything, if you're an insurance company and you you know you don't see umbrella policies typically at the lowest level because if you say I'm going to cover auto, I'm going to cover property, I'm going to cover your workers' comp and all those type of things, um, there's really no rhyme or reason to it. There's no historical basis of what kind of losses each one's going to ha have because you're going to want to have different deductibles because the exposure is going to be different based upon the operation. And so that's why brokers they're going to sell one type of coverage, you know for each one of those things, and that's really the idea when you look at, uh, you know, doing that. And it helps spread the hazard risk, and we'll see how, see how that works with pulling in a few moments. Uh, as far as the operation, insurance plan transfers to the insurer the risk the insured organization's losses will exceed the premium, which is based on average expected losses. Okay, so kind of, let's take that slowly. Insurance plan transfers to the insurer the risk that insured organization's losses will exceed the premium. Um, uh, so, what basically what that means is that if I'm going to pay a thousand dollars for uh, automobile coverage, you know, uh, you know who's you know who's taking the risk at that point? Well, I get to sleep at night knowing that they'll pay up to fifteen thousand or whatever if I'm in an auto accident, uh, and they're taking the risk that hopefully they've made a good bet, and because they looked at my driving record and they didn't have any points and things like that, um, that they're going to basically be able to make money on me. And um, so that's, you know, it's somewhat going, you know, insurance is going to Vegas. It's about probabilities and it's looking at what's a good risk. You know, how much do you want to bet? What's the probabilities uh, based upon historical norms? And it's also based upon the law of large numbers. So the more insurance that you have, the, the, you know, you can take a hit uh, a couple times or more than a couple times depending on how many you have. Again, looking at the Affordable Care Act, you know, the reason why they, they want young people in the, pro, in the pool um, and, and why insurance coverage basically, if you want to say, you know, in the, in the free market the way it is now may not be working as well because young people are not going in there, so you're getting somewhat adverse loss selection of people that are more expensive to cover. So the older, of course, uh, you get, the more expensive the treatment will be. And so you need basically those that hopefully will not need coverage. They're going to pay a little bit less, but they'll help with that, with that, uh, that aspect of it. And then finally, pooling is a fu uh, really uh, it's fundamental risk management concept, uh, and it's also you know when we talk about pooling, insurance companies are essentially doing that. They're pooling, um, and it's the idea that we're basically getting people together to form a co-op uh, or a risk pool in doing so. So even though when we talk about insurance, it's the same idea. It is essentially pooling on a much larger scale, and usually across states and, and across other organizations. So specifically, we talk about a pool. What is it? It's an association of persons or organizations that combine their resources to economically finance recovery from accidental losses. Now, in a pool, um, the way that's described there, you can you can pre-fund the pool, <laughs> or you can have you know uh, funding after the fact. So the idea is saying we all have a contract, and you know with the ARM class, the ARM 56 classes, and I'll use this example later. We're going to have our own auto insurance um, company. And so what we decide is, you know, but we're going to make it so no one has to pay anything up front. But if we all agree, we have a contract, and so hopefully people have cash on hand in the event that I get in an accident and I need $5,000 that everyone's going to chip in, I'm going to put uh, to help pay for that $500 and everyone else will, and that will help basically pay for those. So that's the idea of a pool, is it can either be pre or post, but typically everyone, everything's going to be pre-funded because uh, you know, if it's the uh, end of the month and you don't have that much money, then I might be, may not be able to get the money to help pay for that claim. And so we want to make sure the money is available. Um, also, pooling reduces risk without transferring it. Um, so when we talk about transferring it, is that in a risk pool, everyone owns the risk. Um, and, and, and I would argue, and some would argue, that in many ways, technically, you never really transfer risk. Um, you're technically pooling even when you buy it from an insurance company because they'll just raise your rates or do other things next year. So it, it's the same type of thing. But at least for purposes of, uh, of the class, we want to consider, you know, it, it, we're, we're keeping the losses within our organization, so that's how we're going to pay for it. And we reduce risk when the pooled losses are independent or uncorrelated. So what that means is that um, if we decide to form a risk pool and we all live on the same block, it may not be a good idea if we have a whole bunch of thefts going on because now most likely it's going to be correlated that we're all going to have claims because we're in the same area. So typically, or if you think about a, a, home, a, 
homeowner insurance policies. They don't want to write all the claims in the Bay Area because then the correlation of all the homes of having earthquake damage or something like that, they wrote earthquake coverage would be part of that or uh, wildfires or things like that. Um, so the question that someone did ask is, is pooling also like a captive group? Absolutely. So it, it just pooling, um, it, you know, a captive is a, it's, a, it, it's an insurance mechanism, but it's pooling on a much larger scale for much larger companies, uh, but essentially is the same. Uh, it's the same idea. It's an association. Typically, um, like Home Depot, what they're going to do is form a captive, and they're pooling. What they're doing is all the locations are going to be buying insurance as part of that, but essentially, it, it, I would say it's very similar to, uh, to, to how that would work. Um, and so the question also is, so it makes them similar to being self-insured. So uh, yes, I mean, so, so the two questions there, as far as pooling and being self-insured, most public entities in the state are belong to a joint powers insurance authority. They, um, they're all pooling their resources. and. Um, and the reason why they pool, most entities would self-insure if they could just to do it on their own because then they don't have to worry about, you know, Bob over here not, you know, being, being a little bit less, less safe and having more claims because I'm going to have to pay for it. And so I want to own my own risk. So what the state requires, at least in California, is they require a certain amount of assets before you can self-insure because most independent, whether, whether you're a private company or a public entity, you have to have so much assets. Um, but what you can do, if you don't have those, you can pull, you can come together, um, and then uh, basically uh, form a joint power insurance authority, or in California, what's called a self-insured group, and uh, regulated by the state of California, the Department of Industrial Relations, and you can basically do exactly that. So it's pulling is similar to, it's, it's a self-insured group, it's just as a group rather than an individual. So, that's the same concepts when you, as we go through here, just the idea is are you sharing with others or are you just keeping it to yourself? So the other question is, is there a pooling agreement everyone signs that spells out uh, what uh, each person agrees to do, you know, somewhat of a policy? Absolutely. And so within a, um, now it's, instead of being a policy, it's typically as an MOU. Um, uh, so Joint Pool uh, Powers Authority, what they will do is they'll have an agreement and by signing, by being a member of the pool, there's joint and several liability. They indicate that, that they can be assessed. And so uh, these things are very strictly written. But in there, it also says what's covered, just like a regular insurance policy, is exclusions and other type of provisions. Now, being a co-op or a pool, which everyone owns, I mean, so if there's 50 people in the pool, I'm 150th of the owner. So everyone is part owner when you think of a pool. So it's like a mutual benefit company, is a, you know, a mutual insurance company, is that um, I can request of the board or those that uh, of the rest of the members saying, you know, this isn't covered, but would you mind covering this for me? And they can make a decision to make an ex exception, so they can change the rules um, as they go um, if everyone agrees. But that'll be written in the bylaws to say, okay, it takes this two-thirds vote to make a change to what the policy coverage is. But typically, that's done on, a, on an annual basis as well. But yeah, good question. Um, and then finally, losses are independent when each loss occurs independently, not subject to common cause of loss, which I just mentioned would be like a wildfire, earthquake, flooding. You know, so Philippines would be a good example. I mean, all the losses there, they're correlated. You know, you think about all the different things going on. If that's touching property loss, you know, there's, um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think, um, loss of life, obviously. I mean, there's, there's business interruption. I mean, you think of all the different things that are going on uh, there. It really affects all lines of coverage. And I would say just like um, uh, Superstorm Sandy, um, you know, um, uh, September 11th affected. I mean, that affected all lines of coverage as well and affected the reinsurance markets as well. So the example that they, you know, they give is, you know, uh, the probability distribution in this case, they, they give one for Galston and Atwell, and they kind of use this as an example as we go through here. And the idea is, is they say, okay, typically for the, each organization, on the expected loss, I'll just kind of show what's on here, is that we typically see that um, they show outcomes of zero loss is 80%, meaning most likely 80% of the time in a given year, so this is, this is a given year time period, in a given year we have an 80% chance of not having any accidents or any losses associated with our, for our pool, uh, in this case most likely auto. And then we have a 20% chance of having a loss that's 25, at least $2,500 or no greater than, that's kind of the way really this example works. 
Um, and so when we look at that, so if you're to say, okay, the probability, you know, 0.2 times 2,500, this is from the ARM 55 as well, and 54 discussions, their expected loss in any given year is going to be about $500. And that means we should collect, you know, a certain amount of money over a period of time and we develop a pool. Well, the example I kind of give is the same idea that we talk, if we were to form a risk pool of the ARM 56 class participants auto insurance company, uh, we have, let's say, 100 participants, and we each have one vehicle, so we have 100 vehicles, and we're basically going to charge $500 per vehicle. That's the premium we're going to charge for this insurance coverage. Um, and um, so basically, we're going to collect $50,000 per year. Now, let's say the probability of an accident within our group, uh, well, we wouldn't live in the Bay Area, so it's uh, so 10%, maybe that's going to be a different location, uh, of, where, of, of a possibility of an accident is 10%. And the average cost of an accident, let's say, would be $5,000. So basically, the idea would be is that um, if we assume that we collected $50,000, you know, when you think about a risk pool, so well, how many claims could we handle? You know, how many hits of full maximum value, let's say 5000 is the most we would pay? Well, we can only take 10 claims. So anything less than that, that means we're going to be able to refund money at the end of the year and give it back and say on a pro rata share. So let's say we only had... We had two claims, so we had uh, two claims of five thousand. We spent ten thousand dollars. Then we, that means we're left with forty thousand dollars. And this is the beauty of really a pool. What we would do then is we, by the way, the fifty thousand we we would invest that. We're going to put that into some safe investment type thing. And well, nowadays, well, let's for easy math, let's just say it's five percent. We even know that's nowhere near what we're going to get right now. But let, you know, for five percent, fifty thousand dollars. Okay, we're going to make you know a decent amount. You know, we're going to make some interest off that. Um, and so that that becomes part of it. But just for simple sakes, we'll just say, okay, we paid out ten thousand, we're left with forty thousand. So at the end of the year we say, okay, let's divvy it up among the members. So if everyone paid in five hundred originally, guess what? You everyone's gonna get four hundred dollars back. Um, and plus interest, whatever the pro share of the interest might be. Um, what a lot of joint powers insurance authorities do now is that they've actually they've funded their risk pools on auto. Auto is very predictable. It's an ideally insurable risk. Um, and what they've done is they put in their money, their 500, and they've done it each year, and it kind of builds up this nest egg. Well, it's gotten to the point that the interest that's generated off that, they don't even have to pay the 500 anymore. It's self-fulfilling. It basically now pays for any future claims, and they don't even pay into the loss fund. It automatically is going to pay for those automatically. Um, and that on auto is a pretty good example. That's, that's easier to do. Uh, because they're fairly predictable on um, what they're going to cover. So going back to the uh, Galston and Atwell example with their pooling. So it talks about, you know, we did a simple probability before. Now it's saying, okay, well, let's look at the other possible outcomes we might have. So one possible outcome is that uh, neither organization has a loss. So what that means is we have 0.8 times 0.8. So the probability of both organizations not having a loss in any one year is about 64%. That's pretty good. That means we have a 36% chance that we're probably going to have at least one is really what that's saying. Uh, examples two and three is basically Atwell has a loss, but Galston doesn't, and then vice versa. So that, that's a 16% chance on, on those on the last one. And the, and the po probability of that both of them will have an accident in the same year, that's at least, uh, which would mean we'd have a $5,000 total loss, is about 4%. And so what this is basically showing here is you, you do your matrix of saying, okay, what's the possible losses here? So 25, five, so we look at it's about $5,000 is most likely what our potential loss is going to be. Um, probability in any one given year is what we're looking at. Okay, and then base, then it goes through and you say, okay, based upon that, what's the probability? And it comes up, it's saying, what do we need to collect it? Um, and this is a basic, you now. You know, collecting 522 people. You know, but this is but this is what the expected value. This is what an actuary would would expect in any given year. Most likely, each organization is only going to have to pay 500, but you build up this risk pool, and it builds up over time. Um, and what they basically want to show on the next couple slides here. Uh, first, we'll talk about these definitions, and then we'll show the example um, on there. So, pooling does not prevent losses or transfer risk. It does reduce risk borne by each participant. It's the key point there, when, and this is most likely from a question on the exam, is you know, when you do pull, it's not preventing, it's not transferring, uh, because you're not, there's no, 
There's no efforts on your part at this point. You're saying we're just going to share the cost. That's all we're doing at this point. So it's reducing what each person would bring to the table uh, or have to pay. Um, and it, a point does not change your organization's expected loss, but makes both actual loss more consistent and less variable. And you'll see that in the chart. The idea is that more polling participants you get, the less variability, you know, variability. It's going to be more consistent over a period of time, and that's why it's a good insurable risk because we have it's fairly predictable what you'll have. Also, so as pools increase, the probability of extreme outcomes decreases. Um, so the idea that you have one claim that's fifty thousand um, dollars, you know, right now you can take a hit, and it could be a really big one. And how you can absorb that with just two members on a larger one, you know, what we have to pay for that fifty thousand dollar hit is not going to be as much. You know, you know, two members versus 50 members, it's going to be uh, a little bit easier for us to do. Uh, probability uh, also pull, as a pull increases, probably the average losses will be at expected increases. Again, we'll see that in the chart, you know, um, that the more members, the law of large numbers, basically, and it also becomes more bell-shaped. Um, and basically the example is, you know, the, you know down the law of large numbers, we talked about that. Uh, so one of the questions, will there be a test question on how to figure out how pulling reduces risks with probability numbers, um, with the dollar amounts and total bit losses, uh, most likely not. So the, what we basically saw before, th that was actually done in a previous mm -hmm. uh, chapter. What they basically want to demonstrate here is, do you understand how polling works and how do you understand the concepts of how polling works? So that's really what they're looking for, not to do calculations uh, on this type of one. So this is the example that they give in the um, in the book, basically kind of describing this. So. If you look, if we have four participants, you can kind of see how losses might be spread. With four participants, we have a four, um, here's a what, 40% chance of no losses. And then, uh, and again, these numbers change because we have more participants, so that's why the, now zero losses is, um, is not 65%, I think we have, or 64% has been reduced because with more members, we do expect we'll, you know, we're probably going to have losses or more uh, than, than uh, because we have more members. And you can kind of see how things kind of get spread out. But then here, this is with 20 participants. And you kind of see what they talked about with the bell curve. That you're going to have more losses. The expected values can be closer to 500, just like it was over here. And even though there's no, you know, you're probably going to have some losses here. But again, your average loss is going to be much smaller when you look at those things. So when we talk about pooling, and we talked about um, positively correlated losses, um, in the example I gave, you know, you know, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, wildfires, you know, when we have a positive correlated loss, it means it increases the probability that multiple pool participants will suffer simultaneous losses. Um, so Lake Tahoe, when they had the wildfires, or certain or near Yosemite, you know, um, if we have a lot of insurers in the area, I'm the one writing coverage, um, you know, it's at some point, being, if I'm a broker trying to sell, at some point, an insurance company say, I'm not writing policies anymore. We're done writing policies in this area because it's, they, they, it's going to be start to have more of a correlation. If something bad does happen, we'll stop doing that. Um, and also, the results, um, you know, when you, uh, with that, is the average losses are more difficult to predict, and the distribution has a greater variability uh, or a higher standard deviation. So when you see, um, you know, when the when the losses are uncorrelated, we have a better idea of where they are. When they're po with a positive correlation, meaning that we have it, we're going to have a bigger spread of losses. Okay. Now, so what? This is one thing that was in a prior chapter that I'll see if I can try to explain for those that weren't in the past chapter. You actually want a bell curve <laughs> that's somewhat narrow as possible, uh, because what happens is that when you have because it's your standard deviation. So if you figure one standard deviation, that means 68% or 70% approximately of your losses are going to occur mainly under this bell curve. When you go out here, now you have a lot more variability in here. So it's a lot harder to predict. And what that also means, it's not, I'm not so much concerned about the variability on this lower side. I'm really concerned about the variability on this upper limit. Instead of saying 1,000, let's call it a million, that you're going to have larger losses. So you're going to have more variability. So that's why I want, you know, I want things that are going to be uncorrelated. It's going to be a better, um, you know, it's more randomness, um, uh, whereas I'm going to see much larger losses per occurrence. And we'll talk about per occurrence coverage, which will also make sense why we're, uh, from an insurance policy standpoint. So we talked about, that's still how a pool works. So the idea of how a pool works is essentially it's a co-op. We're all going in together. We're not transferring the risk. But the concept of 
that we have to collect a certain amount of money is basically the same from an insurance company standpoint. It's just who really who's paying the premium and who's sharing the risk at this point. So when we do, so insurance is going to be different. Insurance transfers risk from the insurer to the insurer in exchange for premiums. Okay. So basically from premiums, I'm going to pay $1,000 or $10,000, and now they take on that risk. And what that allows me to do at night, if I'm a pool, if I have a large loss that exceeds what we paid in, that means I have to go back to the, everyone and say, we need to collect some more money to help pay for this. If under an insurance policy, because I'm transferring the risk now, I pay my $10,000 and I, and I have a big claim, and they, they can't come back to me for more money during that policy year. So as a business, it provides stability to, for planning to say, I know how much I'm going to pay, and I'm good with it. And that's why you typically see small businesses go to what's called a guaranteed cost or first dollar program for workers' comp or other things because they know they pay this amount, they're good, the insurance company handles it. Now, the only thing that happens, though, if they have large losses, next year they get the premium bill maybe higher, and then they're going to have to pay for it, but at least they know that's what they're going to pay for that next year as well, and they would rather deal with that than having the idea of um, you know, a lot of fluctuations. As a business gets larger, like a Raley's or Home Depot, they have enough assets and other things that they can absorb those fluctuations and basically can self-insure at that point to do that. Uh, also, an insurer has additional financial resources to fund losses and has a stronger guarantee that sufficient funds are available in the event of a loss. Uh, because that's what their business is. They're also going to be investing in those dollars. They also build into their premium uh, you know, cushions, and we'll talk about some of the margins uh, that they, they build in there as well, or what, what's called a risk charge, which is basically, which is amount above expected loss component of premium to compensate insurer for taking on the risk. So they're going to have an idea of, based upon your losses, and you say, okay, over the past couple of years, we know that you pay about $20,000 in workers' comp. But just in case, I'm going to charge about, this, you know, in many ways it's almost like a confidence level. They're going to charge an extra 20% on top of there, maybe 40%. Uh, and that's the risk charge. Plus they have their overhead that they're going to have to pay for TPA and other things that they're going to t keep into account for that. And so that's, that's what you're paying for uh, when you basically pay for premium. They can also do some other things that be, may be part of that. So a lot of them will also provide risk control services. Um, and a lot of them don't. <laughs> um, typically, the first thing that gets cut in a hard market is risk control. Um, so risk control services are, would basically be people like me that would identify loss exposures and recommend ways to control risk of loss. That would be someone that would go out into the field with the, ins the, those, the companies insuring and say, here's some things you may want to implement. Here's some good ideas. It will save money to do that. Now, the insurance company has an incentive to do that. Um, because if the person, if the organization company doesn't have any losses, that means they just made more profit on the premium because they didn't have it. Um, but unfortunately, hard markets, they look at, okay, what's the hard dollar cost of providing those services? And typically, they'll cut those, uh, and they'll take their chances many times. And that's what we saw a lot of times is there's usually a very cyclical nature within the insurance market where they hire a whole bunch of loss control people, and they get rid of them, and then they hire them back. And it's unfortunate because if they just, you know, did it regularly, I think you're much better off. Also, the insurer bears cost of losses, which creates incentive to identify and implement measures to control. Uh, and the insurer has the incentive to keep premium for next year lower. Um, and this also might be sometimes seen just as the cost of doing business. Um, so that's part of why we want, you know, you might be looking for risk control. There would also be claim and legal services. So typically, an insured company, they're also going to have a third party, you know, instead of a third party ministry, they do in-house adjusting. So that's part of the services they'll typically provide, as well as legal services uh, in the event that you know claims need some of that, or an investigator services for fraud. They'll usually have investigative services as well. Um, and also, part of the reason sometimes it mentions in here, you know, why do you want to have an insured company? Or you know, is a lot of times it's not it's not UC or some other organization. It's not Home Depot denying the claim. It's it's the insurance company. They're the bad guys. Um, and so that's also an advantage to some organizations. They'd rather have it be the bad guys and not be seen as us denying the claim in some cases. And so that's sometimes seen as an advantage uh, on those. Some of the other benefits of insurance that they list uh, in the book, um, uh, you know, anything with the list, I, I take a look at some of these. But um, you know, obviously pays for losses. That's one good thing. Manage cash flow for uncertainty. Um, and that goes back to the whole premise that if I pay a premium, then I'm done. 
uh, help comply with legal requirements. Um, you know, for workers' comp, it's mandatory. You know, every employer, basically in, in every state, has to have workers' comp insurance coverage. Uh, and the easy way to do it is you show your proof of workers' comp. If you're done. You know, you, you comply with the legal requirement. Uh, helps with efficient use of the church resources. Um, I don't know if this, I necessarily agree that it promotes risk control activity. I'd say when you're self-insured, it promotes much more risk control activity than when you buy insurance. Uh, but that can also be a thing when, because the insurance companies may require that you implement programs and that would be the benefit there. Um, there are actually more activity on that front to where, uh, I know for homeowners policies, uh, especially in the Sacramento area, where they're, they're actually driving around homes and if there's brush and other things, they're saying, we're not going to insure you unless you clear all this brush. So that's becoming more and more common because they don't want to take on a, a, a basically a bad risk. Uh, support for insurance credit, source of investment funds um, uh, as well, and then reduce the social burden. Um, and the, the idea is insurance helps to reduce the burden to society of uncompensated accident vi victims. Uh, so if you think about in California or most other, many other states have no-fault insurance, the idea is it doesn't really matter who is at fault, that the person is going to somewhat be made whole through the insurance coverage. That's why everyone mandated to have uh, the coverage, and because otherwise you'd have more people suing. Uh, Same thing with workers' comp. You know, you really can't sue if you're injured on the job. It just pays for it, and that's the other reason why you want to have the workers' comp insurance coverage as well. I want to give you an example of promoting risk control activity and homeowners insurance. If you install a seismic gas valve on your gas meter. In California, a number of insurance companies, the incentive is we will lower your premium because there won't be a fire following the earthquake. Good. Yeah, okay. you know, so this one that yeah, no, that's perfect. And so the example, for, just in case those couldn't hear, that the um, that you have a was a seismic seismic valve, a seismic valve, valve on a gas valve. In the case of an earthquake, it'll basically help shut off yeah. the gas and help prevent a fire. So insurance companies will give a credit for something like that. Um, looks like we do have. I don't know if someone put, lowered their hand there. Um, and uh, so, I mean, there's those type of situations, um, uh, a lot of, or for fire insurance, you know, for property coverage for fire, having sprinklers installed will lower premium, you'll get credits for that. Uh, if you think about your homeowner's policy, okay, if you have, what is it, how close you are to the fire station may give you a credit, um, having a, you know, the um, a burglar alarm will give you a credit, I mean, there's certain things, uh, a newer roof they'll give you a credit for, because if you go from a shake to a, you know, a composite roof, they're going to give you credit for some of these things. Or if you have a pool or a trampoline, they're going to charge you more. <laughs> Just the opposite because they're more likely to have, or what they consider some type of vicious dogs, those are things they recognize as likelihood from past experience, and we're going to need to charge someone a little bit more on this. So ideally insurable loss exposure. Okay, this is the one you want to highlight, circle, or whatever you want to do to, because this is one that's most likely going to be on the exam. So. Um, because this is really, when you think about what insurance companies, what, why we have the lines of coverage that we do, that we have specific forms for, it's all these type of things when you think about it. So they'll generally prefer to provide insurance for the potential financial consequences of loss exposure that have these characteristics. So loss exposure involves pure, not speculative risk. So the idea is it's, you know, a speculative risk being like hedging, they're not going to typically, um, or that would be like, uh, what is it, uh, orange juice uh, futures or, you know, those type of things, it's speculative. They're not going to usually want to get involved. There are some that do that. Um, so we're talking hazard risk when we talk about pure. A loss exposure is subject to accidental loss from the insured standpoint. Okay, so what that basically means is that um, it's less likely that people are going to do things on purpose. Uh, do I really want to get in um, car accidents all the time? Do I want, I mean, what's... Um, you know, so I'm trying to think. Okay, jumping out of airplanes, man, that's not a good example. Um, I'm trying to think of good, but when you think about it, what they don't want is something that's most likely to happen. That someone's going to do fires, arson. What kind of business are you in? Um, you know, actually, a good one. You know, even though it might consider accidental loss, would still be you know working with fireworks. I mean, that's one of those things where it's going to have a much higher cost. Um, that, you know, working for fireworks companies is not one of the ideally insured that they want to take on because it's very more likely to happen. The loss exposure is subject to losses that are definite in time and they're measurable. Okay, so when you think about definite in time is you have an, um, an auto accident, you know, we happened at this point 
and um, you're injured and you're going to heal at a certain point or workers' comp, uh, one that's not definite in time would be something that's more environmental. Um, the, you know, environmental losses or pollution, uh, asbestosis, when did, the, when did it actually occur? What, at what point in time? Is it measurable? What was the actual damage caused? You know, so at least with an auto accident, I can say the car cost $5,000 to fix. It happened on this date. We're done and close the books and we're done and over with it. And so that's the idea of what's measurable at definite in time. Uh, lost exposure is one of a large number of similar but independent exposures. Okay. That's why auto insurance, property coverage, it's, that's why you have the lines of coverage. It's very similar from that standpoint. The lost exposure is not subject to a loss that would simultaneously affect many other similar loss exposures. Uh, loss would not be a cata uh, catastrophic. Okay. So typically, most insurance companies, uh, well, the reason why uh, TRIA isn't typically, you know, terrorism insurance, why you, insurance companies don't offer earthquake, that's why we have a state-funded earthquake, why do we have a national flood insurance program, is because the loss exposure uh, that would be subject to be simultaneous in effect and, and, and have similar loss exposures. So that, those are catastrophic losses that would be very similar, and the reason why insurance companies generally don't offer them um, uh, for, for that, and you have to have access or you have special coverage for that, and that's why the state gets involved, because there is no coverage available for those type of things. And also, finally, uh, ideally, it has to be economically feasible to insure. Um, and that also goes back to earthquake. <laughs> um, you know, to, for California, I mean, it might be cheap to do it in uh, Montana or some other states because there's really no risk. Hey, I'll sell it all day because there's no risk for harm. But in California, um, I need to charge a whole lot of money because of all these buildings in San Francisco. What's the value of those? And I would have to charge so much money to rebuild and you know the likelihood that it doesn't make sense to even try to offer that type of insurance. So those are the ideally insurable loss exposures that you want to take a look and try to think of examples that will do that. And I think the homework also or the Q&A that you get will also help with that question. So what are deductibles? Well, I think most people are familiar with deductibles either from because they either have a copay in some cases uh, or, or some type of things. But for automobiles, I think most of us are familiar that we probably have a $250 or $500 deductible. Or in some cases, maybe a thousand, probably not more than that typically. So a deductible is an amount that must be retained by insured before recovery from the insurer. So what this um, means is that I essentially, if I want to, if I have a $10,000 loss on my property, I got to come up with a thousand dollars on my deductible first before they're going to pay a dime out. Um, so I can, I basically have to. That's my portion that I need to put in there. So it does allow the insurer to obtain risk transfer needs while retaining those losses that can safely absorb. Uh, and also organizations with no or low deductible would be better off financially in the long run by paying those losses it can afford to retain. Basically what that means is that we're dealing with frequency, <laughs> um, you know, rather than a, you know, somewhat of a severity issue is that from a workers' comp standpoint, if you have a deductible of $1,000 per claim, well, and if you keep on having $500 claims, I mean, that's you can have that if you're under a guaranteed loss program. That means everything is being paid by the insured, uh, which also makes it more expensive because that means there's more handling of the claim, those type of things. So um, it also causes, typically when you have a deductible, um, that you are going to be more cautious with what type of claims you're going to present uh, to the insured. You're, you're also going to maybe do more loss prevention. You're going to try to do those things because Ultimately, if a claim's only if it goes nine hundred ninety nine dollars, you have a thousand dollars deductible. You basically paid for everything anyways, so you want to try to eliminate those as much as you can. Um, so, property deductibles. There's certain types of deductibles that we're going to talk about um, that you know from both liability. So, when we talk about property, uh, which would be more like a homeowner's insurance policy, uh, so would, would specify a type of deductible, but rather describe the operation of the deductible that applies to particular. Policy, uh, and then there's the four categories, at least for property. Uh, you'll ha either have a, um, a flat or what's called or a straight deductible. Typically, that's fairly easy. It's a thousand dollars, or it's two fifty, it's five hundred. That's considered to be a flat. Uh, disappearing or franchise deductible. I'm not actually too familiar with that one um, on there, but let me see if I. I can give you an example. Okay. Yeah. Uh, like a home, some insurance companies for home insurance. <laughs> Even if you have a ten thousand dollar deductible, but if you have one claim that's covered, it's over fifty thousand. They'll waive your deductible, so it disappears if the claim exceeds a certain dollar amount. Okay. So, uh, so actually, in many ways, if you think if you 
uh, if you maybe for healthcare, uh, this is probably a good one because if you go to the emergency room, it's okay, it's a thirty dollar copay, but then if you actually get admitted, it gets waived. It's kind of the same type of thing. It, the idea is okay, you've you've exceeded, they know it's going to go a lot more, so they're not going to even worry about the the thirty dollars. The percentage deductible. Um, that uh, basically, I think, um, you know, it's a percentage of the loss. So if it's 10%, you're going to pay, um, you know, up to that amount of the total loss of so $10,000. If it's 10%, you're going to pay 1000 If it's $20,000, you are going to pay 2000 And then the aggregate annual deductible, um, this would also be similar if you think about health care. You know, the way this would work is that you're going to have, um, you might have a, uh, you know, a $10,000 deductible on property. Well, you take one hit and it's five thousand, and another hit is ten thousand. So once you hit that ten, you know when it's an aggregated, you add them all up. Then at that point, you paid your your portion deductible for the year. So after that, there's no deductible, and it basically moves on. And then the three point one eight, three point one nine have more descriptions on those. Uh, under liability, and this is probably the thing that um, at least I'm more familiar with. Um, is you're going to typically, and this is this is really more an auto insurance. This is the best example when you think about this. Is you're going to have a proclaimed deductible, which applies to all damages sustained by any one person or organization as a result of one occurrence, and um, the occurrence issue is, is important. So if you have an auto accident, that's one occurrence, uh, and uh, you have a proclaim, and what that's going to say is um, that if you have a deductible, it's, you know, again. You know, a five hundred dollar, a thousand dollar deductible. That's what you're going to have to pay for that one occurrence. Then you also have what's called a per accident or per occurrence, which applies only once to the total of all claims paid arising out of one accident or occurrence. Um, this might be, you know, if there's four people in the car, um, you know, you uh, you have there's one accident that occurred. You have four people injured. You're going to have, you know, they'll pay up to fifteen thousand. Per person, and then uh, you know there might be a deductible on that type of thing. So that's where kind of the per accident per occurrence comes into play. Um, uh, but it, it arises out of that that one um, that, that one particular occurrence. Then you have waiting period. Now, typically the waiting period when we talk about that it's more on the workers' comp side. You know, liability. Most people don't think of workers' comp as a liability program, but it is, um, and it's specifying time. So workers' comp usually requires three days or more off before being applied. The idea being that you have to be off work for at least three days, and then they'll kick in the benefits. In New Mexico, it's a seven-day waiting period. Um, so different states have different waiting periods before um, essentially, so it's not a monetary amount as much as it's you have to be off a certain amount of time when you think about those. You can also have what's called large deductible plans. Um, typically, what's considered large uh, for this purpose is, uh, is a per occurrence or per accident deductible over $100,000. So the idea is that if you have a large property claim or um, any other type of claim, you know, workers' comp, you're going to pay the first $100,000 before the insurance then kicks in. Um, now, what also happens um, when, when you have a large deductible claim, the insurer will basically manage the claim. Okay. Uh, and then also periodically we'll bill the insured for the amount of the claim and claims handling expense up to the deductible. So the idea is that you have a large loss. They, they're going to have to pay for the claim, pay for the injured employer, maybe for the car accident. At some point, because you're not retaining, you're not self-insured, so you're not paying anything up front. In this case, the insurance company has to bill you up to that point for that amount, and they're going to do it at, at some type of specified period. Now. The difference between a large deductible and a self-insurance, there's actually two I should have put in here. One and two adjust the claim. Under a large deductible plan, it's those managers, they administer the claim from day one. They're the ones that do it, and then, um, then you're going to get billed out. Under self-insurance, you basically, as the self-insured, self you manage the claim up until the point you reach the deductible or the self-insured retention level because then the excess will kick in. And at that point, then the excess carrier will then most likely manage. There's some caveats of when you have to notify the carrier and stuff like that, but essentially that's really the, the difference between the two. A lot of times people go, well, why, what, you know, if I'm self-insured large deductible and each are $100,000, it's not the same thing. They're close, but again, it really comes down to more anything else of who manages the claim and who's going to own the claim or adjust it uh, during that time period. Can I ask a, a clarification? When I think of a deductible, it, it sounds like the company, if you have a hundred grand deductible, 
the insurance company, I think normally I have to absorb that up front and they pay everything above that. But it sounds like they pay whatever that claim is and then come back come back later on and collect the hundred thousand. Is that Yeah, and and that's and the reason why is because if you think about it, if you think about your own where it's a little different, if we have our own homeowners co coverage, is because we're going to have to pay them that first amount. The difference is if we have a liability claim, which they're paying a third party, I'm not going to be paying the third party because they're adjusting. They're going to they're going to say we you know maybe I do write the check to the insurance company, but they're essentially going to pay it first, and they're going to say okay, we paid Miss Smith fifty thousand dollars. Now you need to pay us pay us for what we paid Miss Smith. So they're recouping up to that deductible amount. That's you know, but you're right. Usually when we think about a deductible, we pay it and then they'll pay us back because we're the ones being insured. In this case, it's a little different because it, when it's a third party involved, that's where it comes in. Or what it would be is under property, we would absorb the first, you know, because we're doing the fixes, we're going to pay this amount, and then they would kick in. So it just depends, really depends on who's kind of getting paid out of it uh, more than anything else. So large deductibles versus SAR, and, and kind of gave an example here on this next slide I just mentioned. So. Uh, large deductible gives insured direct control of the claim from the very beginning. Under self-insured retention, or SIR, it requires strict reporting to insure of any claims that have potential of exceeding the amount of the SIR. Usually what happens is once a claim is determined to be at 50% of the self-insured retention, so if you're $100,000 and if uh, your self-insured retention is $100,000, at $50,000 you need to notify you know, the carrier and say, we're getting close because then they're going to start monitoring. They're going to want regular reports because if you're screwing up things from a legal standpoint, they're the ones who are going to be on the hook for everything above that. So if you have a policy that's self-insured that's 500000 your reporting is usually two fifty, dollars uh, And that's typically how almost all of them will work. And so if we do have a question. Okay, so uh, so the question is, are what you want you to say is there's, there are claim reporting procedures, loss of limb, 50% of the deductible, Etc. I'm not sure if that's what I want to say, but so um, so there would be well, there's claim reporting procedures for the self-insured retention. Um, so th there may be because of a certain type of loss you have reporting to the um, to the excess, and this is you know again the difference between deductible, a large deductible program, and a self-insured retention. But typically, once you reach 50% of of the uh, of the self-insured retention, at that point. Then you're going to have to 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 report it to the excess carrier, um, and and again you want to make sure on the exam know the difference between deductible and self insured retention. Try you know because that's there is there is that difference. They they operate very similarly, but they are different in which they from an insurance standpoint. So this one might make more sense on how this actually works, and uh, what, you know, hopefully we'll do. We're only nine and a half way through here, so I knew we were going to spend a lot of time on this one. So this is a large deductible plan for organizations for workers' comp exposure. So the key points are on here is if they have a deductible of 100000 for each injured person, okay, a deductible of 250 per accident, regardless of the number of persons injured, okay, and then an annual aggregate deductible of 350000 So typically it's not uncommon for policies to have all three types of deductibles in there. You know, they're going to have caps depending on what the situation is. So they say, assume six employees are injured in a single year with four employees injured in a single accident. The table below shows the cost of losses for each employee. So hopefully this will, will make sense here. So the first one is here we have accident one. So accident one, this is our per occurrence or per accident. We have one accident and we have four people involved. The first person had $150,000 worth of injuries or you know medical claims, let's say. Okay, but if you look up here, we have a deductible of 100,000. So the amount of loss is 150. Me as the organization, I'm going to have to pay 100,000. The second person at 85,000. Okay, I'm paying that. And then the third person at 70,000. Well, I'm only paying 65. And the last person at 10,000, I'm not paying anything else. Okay, and here's the reason for that is because once we get up to here, so we're at one, uh, we're at 185. Once if we add these up, we're basically at the 250. So deductible per accident. So right here, we hit our per accident limit total. So that that way, our per you know we've combined the 100 250. So that's that. And so that way, on this other fourth person, because of the accident, I don't have any deductible. I already paid my deductible. The insurance company is picking up the rest. On the next one, I still have another two accidents here. 
Uh, so another one, that, uh, fifty thousand dollars, and because my deductible is a hundred thousand per injured person or two fifty, so I'm within the realm, so I'm paying the full amount. And the third one, we have another accident that's sixty thousand dollars, but I'm only paying fifty. The reason why for the fifty is because now I hit my aggregate deductible of three fifty. So what this basically means is with an annual aggregate, Jeff, you have all these different numbers. The bottom line, if I bought this policy, the one thing I'm not going to pay more than $350,000 in any given one year. No matter how bad all these other accidents are, no matter what, 350 is my limit. What this basically does, it also puts limits. If I only had one accident, then at least I know this is where my cap's going to be. But this is this right here. This is so I can sleep at night. Basically, that's what that's what I'm buying for my premium. Is that 350 is the cap um, on that? Okay. So it looks like we got another question here. Would it be safe to say that the policy language would indicate what the reporting practice required under an SIR policy? Yes, absolutely. So under SI, it's not going to be an SIR policy. Is you're buying excess. Um, when you when you're self-insured, you buy excess insurance typically, and um, and then what's going to happen is that within the excess coverage, they'll say what they're covering and what those limits are, and that they need to be notified. But yeah, it would be spelled out in what the coverage you purchase. Uh, uh, when you do that. So, all right. So advantages, disadvantages of large deductible programs. Um, and this is again, whenever they ask for advantages, this is part of the core questions, the objectives, what they said, what are the advantages. So motive for large deductible plan is to reduce cost of risk and premium reduce for two main reasons. So um, when we look at residual market loading, which is the amount charged to make up for losses in state sponsored plans to ensure high risk exposures. And also insurance premium including insurance overhead costs and profit, and it also increases cash flow. Okay. So basically what did I just say there? The advantages of doing this is that when you look at cash flow, um, because you're buying you're not self-insuring the amount, you know, you're gonna have the cash on hand, you know what your you know what your limits are with a high deductible. You know what your your total losses are, um, so you're not tying up money. And this is the difference, you know, why you would want to do this. Um, the insurance premium includes the insurance overhead costs and profit. So when you look at a large deductible, what you pay, you're done. That's the other thing. So the, again, this is your peace of mind, what you pay for it. And all the, when it talks about residual market loading, um, um, you know, amount charged to make up for losses in state sponsored plans that ensure high risk exposures. Um, so where that comes from is there's, uh, with a high deductible, when you have there's, I'm trying to think of the best way to explain this. Typically, the state will require that ensure that you pay into a special security fund if you're self-insured um, for potential losses that go bad. And so that's where the high risk exposures come in. When you go to a large deductible program, it's already built into, the, the rate is built into that. So you're not having to pay the excess security deposits and other things that go into being part of the self-insured. So that's why that's part of the advantage is what they're talking about up there. Um, I'm trying to think of the name that it's SIGA, Security, um, California Insurance Guarantee Association. Association. So SIGA is in California. The insurers are required to play and pay into SIGA. That's basically it's built into the large deductible program. In California, there's a self-insured version of that as well, but that can fluctuate. Then you also have overhead, you have security fees you also have to pay. Uh, and bonding requirements and surety bonds, I think you have to have as well. The disadvantages is that losses under plan may be higher uh, uh, than expected. So, um, so what, when we're talking about you know losses under plan may be higher, is that you you have a lot of small losses. So if you don't have an aggregate limit, you're still going to be paying all that money for this plan. And you may never reach the deductible level, but you're still so it has the same effect of self-insuring. But you know, so so you may not um, because of frequency. Your frequency is driving your cost rather than severity. I guess that's the best way to explain it. Because the frequency of your claims is really what's going to drive your cost up. The more smaller frequency claims, you may be pouring more more out if you don't plan appropriately. So going to the next thing: need for excess or umbre umbrella liability. And we're kind of. So why would we want excess insurance? So excess insurance covers losses that exceed the limits of underlying coverage or retention amounts. So, um, so 
So typically if we buy a coverage, if you think about it this way, if I buy um, for auto coverage, my uh, car, I'm, what, uh, I'm at 250, 500,000 for my auto coverage. What if I have a claim that's over $500,000? What happens? I'm on the hook. They can go for my home. They can go for whatever else, uh, garnish my wages, anything else. So the idea of excess or umbrella liability is that you can buy additional coverage on top of that. That's why it's called excess or umbrella. Think of it just like that umbrella. It's basically it's going to cover more and provide maybe a million dollars worth of coverage in the event of something going wrong for an auto. Or if you have homeowners, you might have typically in a, under umbrella, it's going to include both auto, property, and liability. If something happens, it really is an umbrella. It's going to cover the other lines of coverage as well, whereas excess is going to be specific to a certain line of coverage of whatever you're doing. Uh, so what's covered by it is going to be varied by the insurer, depending on what type you're getting. Um, typically, the coverage is less broad than underlying coverage, and that's when we're talking about excess. Excess usually has exclusions of what they're going to cover. They're not going to be, they, they may not cover exactly uh, what was underneath the primary insurance. They may say, we're going to cover only these things and exclude these certain types of claims. Um, so when you, so the three issues relate to the need for excess um, will be the difficulty in estimating maximal possible loss. Um, so this kind of actually goes to David, your question earlier was why would you want, you know, how do you know how much you need? Well. The problem is, is that you may not know what the potential loss is. So David asked a question earlier, well, how much do you know what you need? Well, if you don't have enough losses to make a basis, you might go with generally accepted standards or certain types of things. So you, you're going to buy maybe a $10 million excess will cost you X amount of dollars, but it gives you peace of mind. And so that will help cover the maximum possible loss because you just can't predict it. Uh, also allows for layering of liability coverage, which you'll see basically in the charts here and also has an effect on aggregate limits of how we can basically make, you know, as we talked about the 500,000 coverage, we can up it. We can go up to million, 10 million, 20 million, depending on how we have it layered. So as I mentioned in the beginning, you know, to be able to understand uh, the layering, this is the very basic. This is the, the, our first part of the quilt uh, as we kind of go through here. So what we'll first do is we'll buy our primary coverage, which would be our first layer, uh, which means it'll cover um, in this case, a million dollars, and then the coverage, the most expensive coverage is going to be this first layer because your, your frequency is most likely to be highest in this first layer. The second layer, we're going to buy another million, so one X of one is what they'll call this, meaning that we basically have, after a million dollars, we have another million dollars, so we have, we have two million dollars of coverage at this point, point. and this one's going to be cheaper than this, uh, but we're still, you know, and most likely we may only have Maybe we'll get one or two claims on an annual basis, depending on what our loss history is. Hopefully, we don't have any. In this third layer, which is five million in this case, um, which basically covers. So once a once a claim pierces here, goes to the two million, and now all of a sudden we're in this five million dollar layer. And basically, what that means, uh, and that's going to be your really your catastrophic type of claim. That's it, this. It's fairly cheap probably for this coverage because you're not going to use it very often. Um, and that's the whole idea of it. And that's why you'd want to layer because if you bought it just one policy and went up to, because this right now you have $7 million of coverage. If you're to buy one policy that went all the way up to $7 million, you'd pay a lot for it because you're paying all this, ex, you know, all this yeah. high nobody, end stuff. Nobody even offers a policy. Yeah, no one would even offer it either. So that's yeah. the other point. So most likely you, and so you have different insurance companies and what you do is they specialize in saying, you know, I'm, I'm, fine taking on this risk level and they'll do that. And so they're very structured uh, in what they're doing. So the third level layer, would that be five X's or two? Yeah, basically be five X's because they're not going to attach until you hit the two million dollars. Right. Absolutely, yep. Um, and when we get to the quilt, you'll see how that you can have it to be 1.5 of excess of you know, all this other stuff. So, so what's the difference between excess uh, versus liability policies? When we talk about liabilities, we're talking about umbrella. So the basic distinction, and this is something most likely to be on the exam, is really what's the difference. So an excess liability policy is designed to provide excess limits of coverage above the limits of an underlying coverage. An excess liability policy, therefore, offers no broader protection than that provided by the underlying coverage. And usually, in fact, as it talks about, it's probably going to be more restrictive. Um, so it may not provide for defense coverage. They're only going to pay for losses. Okay. An umbrella policy, typically, as I mentioned, will cover um, it provides 
uh, not, you know, provide the additional limits, it'll provide the excess, but most likely it's also going to provide coverage for some other underlying issues. So um, the idea, again, homeowners is a good example. You know, a lot of people buy umbrella coverage because it's now going to, you have your single policy for auto and you have your single policy for property and then maybe you have some for workers comp because you have people working at your home or doing stuff. Essentially they're going to put an umbrella and they're going to cover and provide limits of maybe a million or two million in excess of what your other policies are. And so it basically covers you uh, on, on those other three types of coverages. Um, and talks about uh, subject to the insured's assumption of self-insured retention or retained limit. Uh, and they also provide for defense coverage. So, um, you know, most people don't look into umbrella. They kind of hear about it. But, you know, uh, for those people that have pools, trampolines, or business dogs, <laughs> Typically, umbrella coverage is a good idea because if something bad was to happen, especially with a swimming pool, um, the umbrella coverage would, would help provide the defense coverage where a homeowner's policy probably wouldn't provide defense coverage. An umbrella would then provide that in the event something was to happen. The more likely area you'll need umbrella is with your car. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's the severity that you can cause with your, with your vehicle compared to a personal liability loss at your residence is way, yeah. way higher. So. And that's true. Yeah, so, you know, a car coverage would be more of a reason to have an umbrella. And I agree because most people, and that's what most people don't realize, if you, you know, everyone just gets the cheapest auto. So this is the lesson. It's not in the book. This is the one. If you have a car and you have a home and a family and, you know, people think, I'll just get, I'll just do the 2550. I'll do the cheaper insurance coverage. What people don't realize is that coverage is that whatever they have, that they're exposing their home uh, to that. So that's why I have higher coverages specifically for that reason, um, because if something was to happen, then, uh, then of course, and that's why you want the umbrella, like you mentioned, because then that even provides broader protection than uh, even what the uh, auto insurance coverage would have. All right, so now we're going to the quilt work a little bit more here. So what this is giving an example of is two of how basically an excess policy would work and then how an umbrella policy. So on this side, we have the excess policy. So this is uh, the commercial general liability coverage. We have a million dollars here. And then we have auto, which is also another million dollars. And the excess liability policy, in this case, is essentially, um, you know, it's, it's covering both for general liability and auto. Um, typically, you know, the, because it's liability, if you have property, then maybe you have another one here. But in this case, it's only providing for those coverages there. Under the umbrella, it's, you know, the underlying coverages are the same, but the umbrella, we still have the $2 million. What happens here, and this is where it's kind of a little different, is they may, within the umbrella policy, they have something, let's say this is for a work comp claim. Someone got, was working on your property uh, or something like that, maybe the, you know, um, where, um, where you'd have umbrella coverage. What they're saying in this is that under the umbrella policy, it has a 25,000 deductible or self-insured retention. And so even though this is a million here, the million doesn't kick in until that 25,000 is paid. So that's why you kind of see this little bump Right here, because if you load it all the way down, it would be the same thing as a million, but you have to pay that. So this is a million X of 25,000, basically, is what this coverage is here. And so when you buy umbrella, depending on what you have underlying, you're going to get this kind of, it's not always going to be even. And what I recommend, and I always, when you, on a test, they'll have pictures probably like this, but if they give something written down and they talk about it, draw pictures. <laughs> because that's going to be your best defense of really being able to answer the question, because you can go, on here that says the umbrella policy covers some exposures not covered by the underlying subject to a $25,000 retention. Okay, so you, if reading this, hopefully you should be able to be able to draw the pictures, essentially is what you're trying to do. So excess liability insurance, organizations that need liability coverage beyond that provided by their own commercial general liability policy, policy may purchase excess liability insurance. Um, they take three different forms. There's what they call a following form policy. These are things you do want to know. So um, these, you know, I try to get the essential elements for the, for the course. A following form policy essentially says whatever the, your primary coverage says, we're going to do exactly that. It's following form. That's exactly what it means. It's following exactly the same coverages. You can also have a, a self-contained policy that would be uh, subject to its own provisions. Um, they don't use the word manual policy, but basically the idea is that they're going to write something that's very specific um, that says we're going to cover these things excluding these type of events. You know, we're not going to cover pollution or whatever. And where this usually comes into play, with insurance, commercial insurance policies, 
typically you're going to have probably more following form. Excess, when an organization is itself insured because they already have what they're going to have their coverages, that's when it gets a little tricky is because they may not follow form because they're going to say, we're going to exclude these things and therefore it's not going to be following form. Or the final one be a combination. They'll cover most things, and that's probably the more common is there's going to be, for the most part, have all the um, uh, following form provisions, and they'll have maybe just exclusions, one or two things written in there. So <clears throat> here's some other examples. Uh, and this is the case, they, they have a fax in here. So the facts are a third party claimant won 1.25 million judgment against the insured. The insured's uh, commercial general liability policy, which is primary, uh, and excess liability policy both covered the claim. Each policy had an, each occurrence limit of $1 million. Okay. So basically what that means is that the primary, in this case, so what they're showing is the primary limit was $1 million. And so this is what the primary insurance paid. And the claim was for 250000 so what happened, uh, or the 1.25 million. So the excess insurer then had to pay basically this other little limit. That's all this is really showing in here is that this is the way the limits work. Uh, this is a fairly basic one. Okay. Now we can also have what's called specific and aggregate uh, used with a self-insured retention. So what's specific excess and, uh, and aggregate stop-loss policy? So, specific excess requires insurance to retain a specific amount of liability losses from the first dollar for all losses resulting from a single occurrence or accident. Okay, so specific excess would be, it's essentially per claim and saying, we're only going to pay, so it's kind of the same thing of your auto insurance policy, so we're going to pay this much per, per thing, but it's on a much larger scale, talking millions of dollars per occurrence. This is the max that we'll pay. So, for example, um, you know, you see our workers' comp coverage is $5 million, is our self-insured retention is $5 million. So it's a specific excess. Each claim has to pierce, in order for that excess policy to kick in, has to actually go above $5 million. Well, it doesn't really happen, but that's, you know, because we're able to retain as much risk as we can. But that would be a specific excess. If we said, another way, if we said our aggregate was $5 million, what that means is, uh, or what's a stop loss policy? That means is that essentially it's going to kick. You know, have a, let's say we have a two million claim, a two million claim, a two million claim. We'll pay up to the five million. Then the excess kicks in after the one million, and then pay everything else after that. So that would be the difference between aggregate and a specific loss, uh, or specific excess in that case. Uh, okay. Question: Can they just say something about the word occurrence and how is it used in industry? Um, okay. So. The word occurrence, um, so you can have, and, and really what, okay, so the word occurrence, and this is probably the hard uh, way to explain it from an earthquake. So let's say you have, within a policy, especially on an earthquake policy, they will say, okay, you, you have a 4.5 earthquake. Okay. Then you have an aftershock an hour later. Is that one occurrence or is that two occurrence? Well, typically within a policy, they'll actually state, specifically for earthquake, they will say aftershocks within 24 hours will be considered one occurrence. So the idea is a per, a per occurrence is that it has to have, you know, it's that one moment in time um, in which that claim happened. There's also, I'm trying to think of, well, actually this isn't part of it, the discussion, night, but there's claims made and uh, Per, and, and per, you help me out here, per occurrence, because you have, when, when a claim is actually made against a uh, claim, which policy year, or is it when the accident actually happened? And so this is kind of going a little different than the excess, but th the idea is when you buy an insurance policy, let's say for workers' comp, we're buying it for this one year. And so the, if the accident happens this one year, it goes under this policy. But a claim is made policy is, is when the claim is reported to you, so even though the, the occurrence could have happened a few years ago, but it's made, the yeah. claim is made in this policy period. So there's what the, the per occurrence, if there's an occurrence policy, which is when it actually, you know, so it happened in this, in fiscal year 2014, it's going to go to that 2014 insurance policy. It claims made is, I may have been injured three years ago, but I made the claim now, and it's going to whether insurance policy is in effect. So that, that hopefully I hopefully didn't confuse you even more there, Hans, but, um, 
But the idea of, on a per occurrence is that there's a specific time and function, and so insurance company, they can't leave the window open for a long period of time. So they're very specific. And this actually goes back into um, what New Orleans, when they talked about, you know, what was the actual damage? Was it the flood? Was it the hurricane? What was it? What was the occurrence that they actually had to pay on? And so that's why insurance policies, the way they're written, um, and then of course, typically insurance companies try to get out of, have the paper claims, to say what it is. So that's why occurrence is, is really a, a fairly important term uh, to know when we talk about a single occurrence. So it's going to typically on auto accidents, the occurrence is going to be different depending on the type of claim. And it's going to have a set window, but it's still usually going to be somewhat determined by the type of claim you're having. And so the other question is limits are set by occurrence. Typically, almost all insurance policies will be set by occurrence. Yes. Um, it just it depends on the policy, the type of coverage, but in most circumstances, I would say yes. It's almost all things are going to talk about an occurrence of when the event occurred. You know, when did the collapse of the bridge happen? When did the truck get hit? When did the you know burglary happen? It's all going to be that's one occurrence uh, in, in in that case. So let's look at aggregate excess versus specific excess and how this basically works. So. Um, I think these are fairly good examples uh, in here. So we have a hundred. In this case, we have a hundred thousand aggregate retention with a one million maximum limit. So here's losses from separate occurrences. We have twenty-five thousand, seventy-five, ninety. So our total losses are two hundred twenty-five thousand. Okay, but our aggregate retention, meaning the most that we'll pay because that's what we're retaining, is a hundred thousand dollars. So in this case, what's going to happen is uh, under this, the excess insurance will pay 125,000. So we had 225, take out 100,000 dollars deductible, and we're left with 125 that the excess insurance will pay. Now, if we look at it, and so that's an aggregate retention. Now let's look at it from a different point of view, and this is where, again, per occurrence and whether you do aggregate or not really makes a difference. In this case, it's specific excess, same losses, okay, but none of these pierced the 100,000. You know. Um, uh, in this case, 100,000 specific uh, excess at this point. So right now, because none of the losses exceeds 100,000 per occurrence retention, the insured must retain all the losses. So the difference here is here's aggregate. The aggregate limit's 100,000. This one is a 100,000 per occurrence, which is the specific. None of them pierce the layer. So we're on the hook for the two, full 225. Okay, that's that's all that we're looking at when we look at that that question there. Okay, another question here. Okay, uh, okay. Does this help? Okay, claims made versus occurrence policies. Claims made policies require the claim to be made against the insured and report to the insured during the policy period. Occurrence policies require the claim occurrence to be during the policy period, but have no limit on when the claim has to be presented to the policy. Yes. Thanks, Stacy. That's what I was trying to say, and you said it much better since I didn't have that in front of me. So to repeat this, so. The difference between claims made and occurrence. So claims made policies require the claim to be made against the insured and reported to the insurer during the policy period. So that policy period is usually, you know, whether you know whether it's you know January one to the end of the year. That's a policy period. It's going to be usually one year. Whereas an occurrence policies require the claim occurrence to be during the policy period, um, but have no limit on when the claim has to be presented uh, to the policy. Okay. All right, so let's move on. We got a so we don't go too much over tonight. Um, so here's a combination of aggregate excess. So one, so you can have a policy that has both. Okay, so this is aggregate excess. It says two hundred thousand aggregate retention with a one million maximum limit, and then we have a specific excess of one million uh, for this one. So, so here's the same loss data. So the difference here. So we have the same losses. 225,000, and um, so our policy is 200,000 aggregate. You know, it says the answer at the bottom, but basically, in this case, we're we're basically on the hook for the full 200,000, and the excess only picks up at 25,000. The reason being is we've the aggregate is 200, and we have 225, so just to, you know separate. So these are the simple math problems you're probably going to have to do. Is they're going to ask a question: What's the excess? Who's going to? How much are they going to pay? So I typically don't consider these math problems, but because we've done a lot of calculations, other than just kind of looking at it, and you should be able to eyeball it. 
So it's just understanding specifically what is it looking for, what are they trying to ask, and be able to understand the difference between an aggregate and a specific excess policy, and looking at the data and say, okay, this is what's going on, this is how much we have to pay. Okay? Looks like we do have another question. Another question, uh, are aggregate or stop-loss policies less expensive or more? Aggregate policies are typically more expensive. Um, and the reason why is because you're more likely to hit uh, at a certain point. Well, well, take that back. It depends on how high <laughs> your aggregate or your stop loss is. Um, but typically what I would say is because it, it gives you the peace of mind that at some point, um, and it's based upon your history, you know, whatever the insurance company, I mean, if I did a, you know, our aggregate, well, we don't have an aggregate, but if we did have one at $5 million for workers' comp, um, it would be pretty expensive because we pay a lot more than an annual base with the number of employees, I mean, uh, to, to hit that. So it really depends on the experience, but typically, I'd say in general, stop loss and aggregate are a little bit more expensive because the insurer is taking on more risk that you actually will hit it. When you do a per occurrence, they're going to look at your loss history. I mean, even there, they may, you know, that can also be expensive on, on where it depends on where your attachment point is. You know, but. But typically, yeah, I'd say the aggregate's probably more. All right, moving on. Uh, umbrella liability. So a policy is a policy that can provide coverage for more than one type of liability insurance policy, as we mentioned. You know, it covers other types of things. Um, uh, it's not available under underlying policies, such as drop down. So this is the term that they use. So coverage in an umbrella policy that is not available that's in the underlying policy is said to drop down over the self-insured retention. And then when it does that, it's essentially providing primary insurance coverage. And that was the example that we saw in that little slide thing. And we'll see more of that when we go into the next couple of slides here. So if, when we do that, it provides additional limits above the per occurrence limits of the insurance. It will sometimes take the place of the underlying building insurance when underlying aggregate limits are exhausted. In addition, um, it can cover some claims that the insurance organizations Underlying, bill, underlying liability policies do not cover, and that kind of goes back to the drop-down and the examples there. Uh, umbrella policies sometimes may uh, omit many exclusions that are part of a primary coverage, making umbrella broader, and when there are policy exclusions, they may be more restrictive, such as pollution coverage. Um, so, you know, typically it's broader, but they will have some exclusions in there, and th the main point on this is they'll provide all the information. You just have to understand how umbrella policy works, and then again, be able to describe it in a picture, which we'll do in a moment. So when we talk about this is, you know, when you start looking at, okay, how are we going to develop a, a program? Because the reality is most of us just think, okay, I buy auto coverage and I do that. We don't think of, okay, layering and all these other things are the way they work. And that's what we're going to basically do for the next, you know, 15 minutes here uh, tonight. So when we talk about layers, there's typically going to be a primary layer, which consists of one or more primary coverages with each occurrence, uh, with occurrence limits ranging from 500,000 to 2 million. Okay? Um, now, that's, this is for a large organization, obviously, when we, you know, because most organizations that are going to layer are going to be larger organizations. Smaller ones are probably not going to have to do that. Uh, and most of the time, large organizations are probably going to self-insure that primary layer. So when we talk about the 500,000 to 2 million, that's a large deductible program most likely, but they'll do the same thing under self-insurance. Um, the working layer is, is a, a program that is most often called on to paid claims. So the working layer is basically that primary layer. That's, when we talk about working, that's the money that needs to be available to basically pay for claims. That's that deductible layer. Um, and then buffer layer is a level of excess insurance coverage between primary and an umbrella policy. So there'll be a little bit of a buffer, and you'll see that here in a moment as well when we talk about that. Um, I'm not going to read this, but the main thing on here, what it's talking about, is that what we call donut holes. Um, is that when you, when you start layering coverage, and just what they call like the Medicare donut hole, at one point they talked about, you, you maybe you know, pay for prescriptions up to $1,500, and there's a gap. You have to pay the next 500, and then you have to pay the two. So there might be a hole in coverage, and so that's the issue with layering. Is sometimes you can buy duplicate coverage, which doesn't you're paying for nothing. That's not doing you any good, or you may have a gap that you don't realize. And so that's what this whole thing's about talking about problem with layering, 
um, that someone will with defense costs, some won't. And so that's why, again, drawing a picture, I think, is pretty helpful. So if you can explain this, that you, you understand what we're trying to do here. So this would be a large organization. And in here, we have general liability, auto, employer's liability, aircraft liability, and DNO. So the primary policy layer, so right down here, this is also going to be called the working layer. Okay, This is where we're going to, you know, the primary policy layer, what we're doing. So in this case, for a primary, for general liability, we have $1 million of coverage. Okay, In auto insurance, we have $500,000, and also for EPL, we have $500,000. That's what we basically bought for that, for that coverage, right? Now, in there, we also have, there's a buffer policy in this case uh, that, it's a buffer layer um, that basically we, in between the umbrella and the primary coverage in this case. Um, and uh, so if anything happens in between here, this is kind of, I would also call it a donut hole in this case. This is what we're paying for. That buffer layer is we're going to pay for anything between 500000 and the million that's uh, in here. If you notice how this is not perfect, this right here is $4 million insurance policy, or $4 million. This right here is $500,000, so that's why we have this little dip of what's actually being covered. Okay, So when you look at this, we have $4 million, and then we have another $5 million. So the total amount of coverage you know, is, in this whole thing, top to bottom is $10 million, right? So... And we just have it layered. So we have a million dollar layer, four million dollar, and then a five million. So you can say, okay, four X of one, and then five X of five, basically, if you want to, you know, because this will kick in after the first five million, and that's what we're doing there. Um, and then we have, you know, you know we don't have to quite because we, you know, again, it depends on the attachment point for this policy on the umbrella is actually after the first five million thousand because that's the way this policy was written. On the aircraft, we actually bought five million in coverage. And uh, directors and officers of liability, we have $5 million of coverage as our primary layer. Okay? Why would we buy $5 million on aircraft and not on auto? Well, usually when an aircraft crashes, it's going to be a little more expensive. So $5 million is probably the minimum we want to have. And then directors and officers would also probably be something to concern about. On here, uh, we don't want the excess or the umbrella doesn't cover those type of things. It would be not part of that coverage. And so we're just buying excess policy. This would be 5X of 5 on each one of these policies. So this is an example of um, uh, you know how this would look, and, and again, this doesn't you know does not depict aggregate limits or umbrella drop-down coverage for claims not covered by the primary policies. So it's trying to keep it a simple view. But the idea is, can you explain what's going on with this? That, that's really what the idea is. And then we'll, there's a couple more in here that we'll we'll take a look at. Uh -huh. In those two columns for aircraft and DNO, there's a horizontal line across at the 500,000 level. That doesn't seem to mean anything. Is that just a problem with their diagram? This is a problem with their diagram. Yeah. It's, yeah, because the whole thing is still, because, I mean, if they had a deductible or if they had some other type of thing, it would have shown them that, and they don't. So that's um, that's just the primary policy. Put a line on the graph and yep. try to figure out what it means. Yep. <laughs> okay. So, um, I'll say you might have another conic or mm -hmm. gap issue with all these different layers. You may have different insurance companies involved. And you have to examine all the different policy languages to see how everything gets coordinated. Because otherwise, good point. So, so the problem is, is that so this is where brokers are important because essentially you might have uh, you know you have your million, million dollar policy with whatever let's call, say State Farm, and then you'll have maybe the umbrella policy is also a State Farm. They would probably offer that. But the excess is probably not going to be with State Farm. It's going to be with another company um, that's basically going to have that. Now, when you buy the excess, because we're not talking about reinsurance, we'll talk about reinsurance in another chapter, but when you talk about excess and umbrella policy, this is what you are buying as a risk manager. You're going to be buying these. Reinsurance is what's purchased by the insurance company for their losses in case they screw up. Um, so when we talk about excess, this is what I'm purchasing. My broker's going to help me purchase, and they're going to help align, and they should be the ones helping reading, saying, okay, here's the policies, here's how they align, here's what's covered. And in many ways, I mean, so I would say with UC, we have about 50 different policies. You know, we have aircraft, because we have a, you know, we have a, um, we have, you know, the fleet. Well, auto, we're self-insured. I mean, a lot of them are self-insured, but then there's all these weird, you know, uh, professional liability. I mean, you name it, we have all those different types of things going on. 
And so we just have to be able to manage and know what's covered and what's not. Um, so the question here, the question's asking, uh, so is the EPL total coverage 9.5 million? Okay, so in this case, uh, yes, correct, it is 9.5 million. Good catch. So the idea here is because what's happening on the umbrella policy, since we're not putting the buffer uh, in there, the, the, it's still the, the attachment point for the umbrella policy is at, is at 0 0.5 million or $500,000. And it, so this is what would be called 4x of half a million or 4x of 500,000, meaning that we have $4.5 million in coverage right here, and then we have additional five right here. So yes, that is absolutely correct. Um, and that's the, again, that's why to be able to explain and look at the different policies and how these things interact is, is, is very important uh, to be able to understand these different areas. When we go through the other chapters, there'll be more of these type of charts, but this is, you know, the, the basics of, you know, how you'd layer and what the policies do without getting the specifics of how the policies actually work and how they interact, uh, but we'll cover that in some of the later chapters. So. The next couple, two things are in structure and international insurance program. Um, and this, I'm trying to remember if this was in the old text, but it may or may not have been. The main things you want to get out of here uh, um, is what's considered admitted versus not admitted uh, insurance. Okay, and admitted insurer is an insurer to which a state insurance department has granted a license to do business with the state. Okay, so almost all of the insurance companies you work with are most likely admitted. Uh, a non-adventure is not authorized to do business within within that state. And what that means is they can't sell insurance policies within the state. Now, a captives, so a captive, I'm just going to throw this out there, uh, we have one, is our captive is not admitted um, in, in California. We're, so that means we're not, because if you're admitted, that also means you have to follow the regulations of the state insurance commissioner. We, since we're admitted in Washington, D.C., we fall under the regulations of Washington, D.C. Now, does that mean we can still insure? California? Absolutely, we can still insure. We can't sell insurance to anyone else in California. That's basically what admitted versus not admitted means in this case. We also can't discuss that we, we can't, the, the, yeah. the meetings have to be held out outside of California. of California. That's right. So all business meetings have to be held outside of California. That's the other thing, uh, because we cannot conduct a business in the state as being a not admitted uh, insurance. And there's more details on that. So that's that's one piece of, of when you have your program, is depending on there's advantages and disadvantages of having it being admitted because it, is it recognized? Is the, you know also um, now could we be admitted? We can buy an insurance company that will basically front the papers, to, you know, to, to be admitted in the state, and then we could do that. So there's different ways those type of things can work. Um, the two other types of things they talk about in here um, is an exported package policy which would be a non-admitted package policy tailored to organizations with incidental exposures in countries other than their home country. And the idea is that it's, a, you know, just as it sounds, it's tailored. It's saying, okay, we only, you're only doing auto, so you're going to be driving. So if you're going to be operating in Mexico and you're just going to have people driving cars, okay, you probably want to have a policy specific to that to, to help limit. But we're not going to do any other business, but we're doing, we're transacting business, and we want to make sure that our people are covered when they're down there. So that might be an example of an export, exported package policy. A controlled master program is another non-admitted master policy, and that will be issued in the country in which the insured is domiciled. It will be paired with locally admitted policies. Okay, so that's kind of what I talked about is you're going to find an insurance company that basically going to act as a fronting company. We'll go in more fronting companies when we talk about captives, but the idea is that they're going to write the piece of what they call the paper for the policy. They're going to be the ones issuing the policy paper uh, on your behalf and you're essentially just paying them to, uh, you know, to pass through the dollars essentially for the policy because they're admitted to do business, and and essentially you're still going to pay for all the things, um, uh, you know, with your with your your monies, but they're kind of they're 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 handling the, the the front end for you. So that's basically the, the whole idea between a controlled master program and uh, and the two there. I wouldn't expect a whole lot. If anything, you're going to probably get the admitted versus not admitted. Why is that important? Because, you know, uh, as far as uh, having the ability to do business in a state or not do business is really what the key factor is and how that would work. One thing that I think they didn't mention about the advantages mm -hmm. is for an admitted insurer, if there's a bankruptcy, 
The policyholder is protected by the guarantee fund that's in the state, and a non-admitted company would not be correct. And, and so, and that would be in so California, and back in to, to where that's important, uh, back in 1999, 2000 era. So basically, what we had uh, that's the era with workers' comp. Almost every insh workers' comp insurer went bankrupt or left the state, and we were left with four um, four major insurance carriers for workers' comp, which also was a very hard market. Uh, which about 60% of the business went to state fund, and essentially the state uh, uh, guarantee fund, uh, like home base, and uh, home base was a self-insured, but they're a company that was self-insured. What you had was essentially huge stresses on uh, the guarantee fund because what happened is for every insurance company that went out of business, you had people on workers' comp that were injured. They need to basically still be treated, and so. Um, people, all that money, the excess security funds had to be part of that, paid into it. And so that's why that, when I was mentioning earlier about the uh, residual or market loading, they all had to pay into that th to help a reserve in the event of something like that happening. Of course, they didn't plan for all of them to go out at once, um, but the idea is that there'll be money set aside to pay for those type of things, and that's why the admitted carriers are then required to pay into that. Uh, and that's another reason why uh, captives are not admitted for that very reason because then they don't have to pay into these extra security funds, which they're really not going to probably see the benefit because they're only insuring their own anyways. And that's the idea behind doing that. So the last one we have for a uh, slide tonight of how would an integrated controlled master program work. So the idea is you'd have local uh, property and liability policies for subsidiary exposure. So this would be the local insurance company or fronting company that would be in the foreign country would have these policies written. Then you have this master policy, uh, which is essentially um, would be the you know what's we've embedded. If you kind of see it's actually inside the master policy the, or the local property and liability are inside the master policy um, because it's kind of it's integrated in there. And um, so they're handling the business for us, but we have the master policy, which the claims will be paid. Then we'll have our primary property policy for our domestic exposures. Okay, so that's what we would normally have anyways. So you can see the master policy and these limits are basically the same for the most part. And then we'll still have our umbrella policy that will at least cover. And then we may have coverage for excess losses in the entire portfolio. The reason why there's this little gap here is it's most likely under this property and liability. It's not covering everything. That's why it only goes this far. They're kind of showing it's an odd way to do it. But there's probably some things in here that may not be covered under the umbrella, but would probably cover under the excess. Um, and so again, just kind of looking at the pictures, what is this? What is this kind of telling you? That's what you're most likely going to be asked uh, on the exam. And we actually made it all the way through and only four minutes over. So uh, hopefully, uh, the, you know, we'll go next week we do have chapters four and five we'll be covering. So we've got two, a uh, little bit, uh, at least somewhat smaller chapters, but we'll be able to get through it. And uh, in the meantime, I will post the, uh, everything up on the web and look forward to seeing or hearing everyone next week. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. If we do have one question. Mm -hmm.